Okay, good morning, everyone. I think you're awake from our most recent uh, interactions there, so that's good. So I'd like to talk to you this morning about hearing loss, my favorite subject. I think all of you know that. And I want to review a few updates with you on hearing loss, particularly focusing on those children that are educated in their home school, which is the majority of students who are deaf or hard of hearing. Uh, really only a small percentage of them would be in a regional day school program. Um, I also want to talk about early detection and intervention and why that matters, why educational audiologists matter, thank you, and um, the expanded core curriculum for deaf and hard of hearing students. So here we go. Um, this shows the communication modes that are used by deaf and hard of hearing children. 2% of them use American Sign Language, 1% use cued speech, 6% use simultaneous communication, that would be speaking and using sign language at the same time, and 91% use listening and spoken language only with no sign language. What that means to us is that 98% of children who are deaf or hard of hearing use their hearing. They're, they're using it to whatever capacity they can. Most of them would, well, the majority of them would be using it with some kind of amplification, hearing aids, cochlear implants. That has uh, um, uh, implications for us on what we do in the classroom and how we approach literacy with these children. Newborn hearing screening, and this may or may not be a photograph of my brand new granddaughter, <laughs> just saying. <laughs> Um, newborn hearing screening, 94% of the babies that are born with a hearing loss are born to parents who are hearing. If you take into account children who are born to at least one hearing parent, so one parent has a hearing loss, the other parent is hearing, that number goes up to 97%. So you look at that number that 98% of children with a hearing loss are using listening and spoken language to some degree, it sort of makes sense when you look at this demographic. Most of their parents are hearing. The incidence of hearing loss, um, 1.7 in 1,000 babies who are screened have hearing loss. And at this point, we're covering about 96% of the babies in the hospitals with newborn screening. Unfortunately, we're losing a lot of those to follow up meaning they get screened in the hospital. If they're given a referral to come back, then we, we are still losing too many at that point. They're not coming back for those follow-ups the way we want them to. But, so we're looking at almost all the babies in the country, 1.7 out of 1,000 will have a hearing loss at birth. Um, one in 1,000 of those babies have a unilateral hearing loss. It means they hear fine in one ear, but the other ear, there's a hearing loss. Uh, the rate of unilateral hearing loss can rise to three out of a thousand school-age children because hearing losses are progressive. The most conservative number is that 30 percent of childhood hearing loss is progressive. That number really, a lot of people think it's more like 42, 44 percent. So they pass a screening at birth, but by the time they hit kindergarten, they could have a hearing loss or they pass a screening in one ear, and by the time they hit kindergarten, now maybe both ears are impaired. Um, the other thing about this number of three in a thousand, it actually, that is like a number nobody really wants to use. They're much more comfortable using numbers that look like 30 out of a thousand to 56 out of a thousand children will have a hearing loss by school age. Still, it's still a low incidence hearing loss, but it's, it's more than we think because we just don't see it. The other thing about hearing loss not staying the same is that we all know if we've had a really bad cold or if our allergies are really bad, we may sense that we're not hearing people very well, that kind of in a tunnel or underwater feeling. One in six children have recurring ear infections. So that means that they have a 30 decibel hearing loss, and we'll look at an audiogram a little bit later to see what that means. But basically, when you're all congested like that, when a child in school is, or a baby, or a toddler, you have a mild hearing loss. 
and that's going to impact what you're learning. Um, the thing with children with a unilateral hearing loss is they get so accustomed to using that good ear for everything that now they've got the bad ear and their good ear has a mild hearing loss in it. So that is going to impact their development. Okay, timing matters. The goal, the reason we have newborn hearing screening is the goal is we want by the time a child is three months old, we want them fitted with amplification. We want binaural amplification. We want two ears working on a baby before they hit three months old. And it all has to do with the brain because the, our bodies, a typically developing baby is designed to have things work in synchrony, to develop all the different domains of gross motor and fine motor and um, cognitive development and speech and language. All of those things are timed to happen at a certain time. So if my hearing is affected and it's not on schedule, that's going to cause dyssynchrony in my development as a person. It's going to throw off the way I was designed. So the closer we can get that amplification on a baby to the time they would be normally developing their hearing, the better. It's going to help the brain kind of reboot itself. So timing is really, really critical. It's why we have newborn hearing screening universal across the United States, almost 100% universal across the United States, because we need to get the intervention going. The reason we want to get that amplification on a baby with hearing loss is because that hearing is the basis for developing speech and spoken language. And again, if a child is using American Sign Language, it's a different story, it's a different track. It, you know, there's not better, it's just different. But the children using American Sign Language are not using their hearing. So for the other 98%, what we're trying to do is develop the auditory pathways in the brain so that their brain can then develop the speech, the language, and the literacy that they need to have. In the regional day school programs, all three of them in Central Texas, we really are extremely fortunate. I guess it's you know probably being in Austin that helps us with this. But our three regional day school programs have worked very, very hard for over 30 years to get early intervention, to get audiological management for these children. And the commitment is so great that we have loaner hearing aids. So if a baby is determined that they need hearing aids, your regional day school program, if you're using them for your babies, will give the child, the family, loaner hearing aids. We are already taking ear mold impressions when we meet the family and we're getting permission to work with the family so that ultimately, if that baby needs services, the day we sign the individual family service plan with that family, we can put in the order for the ear molds and get the hearing aids on that baby. That's how important it is. We will start taking those ear molds before we even know if we're going to serve this baby, if they need it, because every moment matters. Some of you serve your own babies with ECI and you are not using the services of a regional day school program. I would encourage you strongly to invest in loaner hearing aids. Everything I'm gonna to say today really is about the long game because the more we do up front, the less we do later. And if we can get hearing aids on that baby and get both sides of that brain working in concert and hearing speech and language, then we can change the learning trajectory, trajectory for that child. We can impact it amazingly. Um, waiting for a family to get these hearing aids can take considerable time because especially as you would imagine, the families that need our loner hearing aids most are also families that have limited resources within themselves they have limited understanding a lot of times of the medical system and the insurance system and all of those other things that have to be pulled together to get hearing aids on this baby. And what we do with our loaners is we don't just give them to them, shake their hands and say, so long, see you later, you know. They truly are loaners that gives the family time to learn about how they can access and acquire their own hearing aids. But while they're going through that process, they've got that baby listening already. 
So again, it's something that I would encourage you to <laughs> invest in. And the more and more we learn about the brain, the more it makes sense. At seven months old, a typically developing child at seven months old, their, um, wait, I'm going to look at this, their speech perception relates to their vocabulary as a two-year-old. Okay? So how I'm able to hear and understand speech at seven months will predict or relate to my vocabulary growth by the time I'm two years old. My vocabulary at two years old is a huge factor of what? Reading. Reading. If I wait and I put a hearing aid on a child when they're three years old, then their hearing age is zero. Their hearing age is the same as baby Emma when she came out two weeks ago because that's when the brain is getting access to sound. So now I would have a three-year-old, yay, they've got a hearing aid. I need to teach them how to use it. I need to teach them how to process that information that's coming in to their ears. It's not like my glasses. I get glasses, I put them on, all of a sudden things are clearer, things are bigger. Hearing aids are not like that. Cochlear implants are not like that. The brain needs time to be trained and to process and to make sense of it. And now I've lost three years of vocabulary. I've lost three years of learning to listen to those small sounds of speech that let me know that there's an ED on a word. I walked home. She goes to the store, that plural S. Those things are very difficult to hear. But again, the baby has to hear them. Kim, for what? For reading. So it's so, so critical. What we do in these early, early ages is so incredibly important um, for the long game. Early, the other thing about all of this is that the early intervention it really requires coaching and training of the parents. And that's what the ECI programs are all about. We show up once a week as a teacher of the deaf or as an ECI case manager, OT, PT, teacher of the blind. We show up once a week. Our goal and our role is to teach the parent to teach their child for the rest of those hours of that week. It really is a coaching model. But we need people that understand the development of all these domains people who understand all the intricacies of speech perception and auditory skills and all of that, to be able then to coach a family to understand to provide a rich language environment for their child. It's not just random noise. They have to learn how, if they don't already know, and some parents just do it, probably most of us in this room just started talking to our babies when they came. Just talking, talking, talking up a storm. Some families don't. Some have to learn how to do that and how to make meaningful sound for their children. Um, even a milder unilateral hearing loss will affect things like um, locating sound, segmenting sounds, um, vocabulary. Again, all the things we talked about that affect literacy later on. Children with profound hearing losses, we're accustomed to them getting services at three years old. We're accustomed to them probably going to the regional day school program, uh, whether they're using sign language or even those who are going to use listening and spoken language because they're still learning at three years old to use their equipment and all. But other children with hearing losses, we're really not accustomed to serving them at three years old. We usually think, especially with a unilateral hearing loss, hearing loss in only one ear. Well, they have that other ear. They can hear just fine. They don't need services. But again, this is what we're finding, that that's not actually accurate for them. Current technology allows children, almost every child, to be able to access the sounds of speech through a hearing aid, through um, a cochlear implant. And so with that technology and with intervention, most of them will have access to it. Now, if they're not wearing that equipment consistently, if they're not exposed to a rich environment, then they will need intervention. And we all know we can't control the birth to three situation. 
We can influence home situations. We can influence daycare settings. We have no control over it. So if those early pieces are not in place, when we have a three-year-old, we've got to look at them and see what needs to happen now to get them ready to be a five-year-old in school. And this is a new paradigm. It's a shift at how we have looked at these children. Because we always function from, well, we provide services when there's something wrong. And what we're seeing is we have to have more specific assessments of these babies. Because you can have a three-year-old whose language looks pretty close to normal, and typically what we do is say, great, we'll see you when you're five and you come to kindergarten. And they show up at five, and they're already behind, and they're struggling. We've got to look at this differently. And guidance from our state lead is supporting this too. That it's, it's a new way to look at getting literacy for these children, getting them on track. Precision matters. The brain is all about patterns and order. And what we put in the brain tends to come out. We can see it. And what audiologists say a lot of time is garbage in, garbage out. So if I'm not hearing clearly, what's coming out of my mouth is not going to be clear. So precision matters. If I'm not aiding a child or giving them you know, really good intentional language development and enrichment, then what's going to be laid in the brain is not going to be clear auditory pathways. And so then if I try to put a hearing aid on a five-year-old or a hearing aid on a seven-year-old, I'll make some progress. They'll get some benefit from it, but we're going to be laying on top of muddy reference points in the brain. So all those phonemes and the phonological awareness that we want for literacy is going to be muddy waters. Maturation of the auditory pathways in the brain is intimately tied to the development of language and speech and literacy. The consistent use of amplification is the most important thing we can do to impact the pathways in the brain. 80% of our learning as people is incidental. It's not a teacher standing in front of us. It's not mom or dad standing in front of us teaching us. It's the stuff we overhear. It's the stuff in our environment that we make connections to. We, we hear something happen in the back of the room, and we say, well, I don't want to do that. And so I've learned something from that. It's incidental learning. Children as young as two years old who have typical hearing learn vocabulary from overhearing other things. They hear mom on the phone with grandma. They hear the television in the other room. They hear big brother say a naughty word in the other room. They overhear things. By two years old, they have this ability to learn from a distance. If a child with a hearing aid is more than three feet away from that speech signal, they're not going to understand it. So yeah, I could have my child attached to me all day long everywhere I go. You know, we're three feet apart. How realistic is that? Cochlear implants give you more distance. They're actually finding that a, a baby with a cochlear implant, a toddler, can actually hear across the room like a typical hearing child would. It's not going to be as clear. It's going to take greater effort for them to hear and make sense of things. They'd probably tune a good deal of that out, but it does give that capability. But again, we're looking at what happens then. You know, if I have a baby with a unilateral hearing loss, so loss on one side, and they're with me being carried all the time or in the stroller until they can walk, I'm not going to see a language delay. Their language scores are going to come out pretty good. Children with unilateral hearing losses typically show typical language development until they reach about 15 or 18 months. They're moving around. They're further away from mom. They're getting into their own little things. They're not hearing speech and language. So even with unilateral losses, if we say a baby at one or two months old doesn't need services, that's great. That's appropriate. We still want to try amplification. We want that family to get hearing aids on that baby, but maybe they don't need intervention for that family. But we should, and again, this is a new paradigm, we should be checking them again at 18 months to find out what's going on. In some families, that baby will be just fine. In other families, they may be showing a delay at that point, and we've got to get involved. 
So I'm not saying from birth we have to follow every child with a hearing loss until they're 18. What I'm saying is if we lay the groundwork right, we really can see fewer of them when they're 17 and 18 years old because we're doing the foundation and getting it going right. Technology is a help. It's not a fix. Even with early identification, early amplification, and high quality intervention services, the impact of hearing loss can still be there. Audition, listening, audition is what the brain does with what the ears hear. The ears really are just a doorway, as Carol Flexer says. It's the brain that's doing all the work making sense of it. And the amplification is not going to correct hearing loss. It just improves the quality of what's going to the brain. Children who have not developed adequate listening skills, auditory skills, by the time they reach school will struggle. Period, the end. If they have not learned to listen, a typically developing child or a child with good amplification intervention by three years old should have developed all the skills they need to listen. They still may need help, but if they have not received those, then we're going to have to intervene and give them that information. Um, detection, discrimination, identification of prosodic features like the duration of somebody's speech, the rate of their speech, the intonation. Are you going to swim after t school today? And our voices rise. All of that information gives us information that we apply then when we go to read and write. Figure ground discrimination, integration, um, auditory memory. It's all developed in the brain. Hearing with both ears matters. And again, we had a lot of stuff, well not a lot, because in deaf ed there's not a lot of people to study. <laughs> but we had some good studies come out in the 1980s that showed that children with unilateral hearing loss and a mild or minimal hearing loss do struggle academically and socially. And now those studies are being revived and redone because we, we know there's a problem but also they're being redone because we know more about the brain. And we know that both ears need to be working in synchrony for the things to happen that need to happen in the brain. Again, the goal is two ears hearing by three months. This is just a recap of a lot of the studies that were done, um, most of them in the 80s, one in the 90s, and now starting in 2004. And last year there was a big push, you, um, internationally to study minimal hearing loss and unilateral, unilateral hearing losses. But you can see that not much has changed. Uh, failing one or more grades, 22 to 35 percent in the studies in 2004, replicated again in 2017, which is basically what they've been saying all along. And I know we don't fail kids, I know we don't keep them back like we used to, but the difficulty is there. They are not working on grade level and progressing. It's 10 times more the rate of a hearing child. A child with a unilateral hearing loss is 10 times more likely than a child with typical hearing to need to repeat a grade. The other thing that happens, especially with minimal hearing loss and unilateral hearing loss, is fatigue and stress. And when a child is straining all day long to hear, they get extremely fatigued, and then they can miss a lot of the information because they're just too tired to hear it. The other thing that impacts them both academically and socially is they stop doing things because they're exhausted. So they, they don't go to gymnastics after school because they go home and fall asleep on the couch or they fall asleep on the school bus. So fatigue and stress are big things. A third of a child's school day is one teacher talking. The rest of the day is what audiologists call exciting activities, which is group work, uh, recess, cafeteria, gym, walking in the hallways. So for a third of the day, they can sit, they can listen to someone using a microphone, they can pay attention, and they're moving along okay. For two-thirds of their day, they're listening in what we call rugged terrain. They're trying to make sense of what's speech and what's noise. Who just gave that answer to Mrs. Smith? Oh, it wasn't her, it was him. And they're trying to localize the conversation in the classroom. And it puts a great deal of stress and fatigue on our children. 
um, the loss of incidental learning when they're fatigued. Um, Hornsby at Vanderbilt is looking at that. Judith Liu looked at her 2017 study was very interesting because she looked at siblings. So she would look at the hearing sibling and then the sibling with the hearing loss. And this, she felt, was a way to account for both maternal education and socioeconomic factors, which are big factors in children with hearing loss. So by looking at siblings, she ruled those two out. And all the children with the unilateral hearing losses still had worse scores on verbal, cognitive, and language scales. These are typical profiles, really, of children with a unilateral hearing loss. Higher incidence of failure, higher incidence of behavior concerns. Teachers rate them more negatively on attention to academic task. Peer relations and social confidence are very low. Dependence versus independence, emotional liability, all affected. Greater effort and fatigue, greater cognitive and overall fatigue than hearing peers, and a higher incidence of negative comments on report cards. Teachers also tend to rate these children lower on just, you know, having Johnny in their class. It's more challenging, more difficult, less enjoyable for the teacher and the peers. Um, and I think we'll look at a slide that will help with that. Judith Liu did a quality of life study, and she found that although there was statistical difference in the quality, quality of life for a child with a hearing loss versus children who were typically hearing, there was a difference in quality of life in those children. But when she looked at children who had severe and profound hearing losses, like our regional day school children, and children with unilateral hearing losses, or just a mild, mild hearing loss, there was no difference in the quality of life in those children. So we're looking at this child, oh, he hears fine, he hears everything I says. He hears when he wants to hear. He has selective listening. He'll be fine, don't worry. You know, he, look, I talk to him every morning before the kids come in the class, and he does fine with me. Yeah, because there aren't 22 other kids in the class yet, he can hear you. So those kids, the quality of life was the same. When they surveyed parents last year, they came up with the same issues. Parents who had waited and did not amplify their children in school age could not believe the difference in their children, in their quality of life, in their behavior, in their socialization, and in their learning. This is a slide from Phonak Corporation. Phonak supplies um, all the regional day schools in Central Texas with our amplification equipment, and they provide most of the state of Texas, so I feel okay using this slide. I'm not trying to sell their product to you. But the audiogram is rated on a decibel scale. Silent reading, so everyone in the room is reading silently, just like you are right here. The decibel level is 56 decibels in a classroom where everyone's doing silent reading. Okay, all you're hearing is the sound of the lights, the sneezing, <laughs> thank you for that well-timed sneeze, the, um, the air conditioner, the gerbil, or the fish tank, the turn of a page, 22 page turns, that's 56 decibels. Children at tables goes up to 65. Working at tables, which we do most of the day now in school, 73 decibels. Group work with movement. So I'm going to get my materials, and then I'm working, or then you know we're, we're doing an active building or experiment together as we're working, so there's more movement. Those all go up. Okay, so here's a review of the audiogram really quick. At the top, and at the bottom are painfully loud sounds, you know, a jet plane taking off right near you. On the left are the low sounds, and on the right are the Minnie Mouse sounds. And the yellow Nike swish, or the speech banana as we call it, is the typical range where we hear speech. So let's look then, if the classroom teacher is talking at a normal level like I am right now, that green line was the 54 decibels we said in a quiet classroom like this. The trick is, that you can hear what's below the line. So if the teacher is talking at normal conversational, like I am now, now I'm amplified, but I'm not raising my voice at all. If I'm just talking like this, and the classroom is at 54 decibels, 
my voice is not being heard by those students, unless it's the child who's right here, or maybe right here. Beyond that, the children, hearing or deaf, on the spectrum or not, second language learners or not, they're not hearing me. And so that's why our teachers are exhausted, because they're yelling all day long to raise their voice and use their teacher voice all day long so it can be heard over this. But let's add in the background noise too. If we were talking about movement in the classroom and active learning, which we love, then the child with a hearing loss is certainly not hearing speech. And a lot of your other children are not either. And if the teacher's shouting all day, then we're looking at the kind of um, signal that's getting, the distortion in the speech, making it harder for children to follow and hear along. Okay, and I'm probably way over. Let me try to run through these. So, this slide, again from Phonak, um, these bars represent 15 children sitting in a classroom who have a unilateral hearing loss. Oh, let me just go back on the slide. So, again, if you have a cold, the common cold, and you're all congested, Look at the line where it says 30 decibels. You're not hearing what is above that 30 decibel line. So you're not hearing Those letters are gone to you. Same for a small child with a hearing, uh, an ear infection. Same with a child with a mild hearing loss. They come to school every day and they cannot hear z, z, z. They cannot hear those sounds. And that 30 decibel line there is where you can just barely detect that sound is even occurring, which means I might be able to hear ch. I might be able to hear m, d, b, but I won't necessarily understand them because I'm just barely detecting that a sound has been made. And that's a mild hearing loss. It matters. So these 15 children have a mild hearing loss in two ears, or they have perfect hearing in one ear and a hearing loss in the other. They're listening at a minus 5 dB, which means that there's a little noise in the classroom and teacher is not using her teacher voice, probably. So if you look at our stars, number three is getting 80 plus percent of what the teacher is teaching. Hoorah! And that's the child that falls asleep on the bus on the way home. But they're hearing and understanding, and that really is good news. It is possible. Um, children 1, 8, 11, they're getting about half of the message from the teacher. What do you think their behavior is like in the classroom? Hearing only half the message. 2, 4, 7, 12, 14 are understanding nothing of the speech that's being spoken in that classroom. Again, I'm not trying to sell this equipment, but if we put amplification on them, classroom amplification, in this case it's a Roger Focus specifically designed for children who have these smaller losses all across the board. They are now understanding the speech in the classroom. So it matters. Amplification matters and appropriate amplification matters. And I'm just going to run through that and say that it matters and it's extremely complicated, especially for these children with the mild, moderate, and unilateral hearing losses. They're different. A profound kid, we pretty much know what we can put on them to get sound and meaning for them. It's pretty straightforward. But these other losses are more intricate. You need an educational audiologist to help walk you through the options because they're all going to be different. Some children do worse with an FM system in the classroom. Some, it really doesn't make a difference, like that student number three. It was not a statistical difference. They were doing fine with just their amplification. With others, they need to mix and match throughout the day. When teacher's talking, I wear it. When I'm working at the group table, teacher can put her microphone down and I can hear my group. 
But if it's a different kind of activity, that doesn't work for me. And not only that, but then the children and the teachers need to learn how do I switch my hearing aid to match when I am or am not wearing classroom amplification. Code of federal, federal Regulation says that audiological management is a related service. And I have to say, in the last several years, many of the districts now are providing audiologists, and we should be, and we need to. Teachers of the deaf do a great job out there with itinerant kids, but it's very complicated. Even the audiologists at these meetings on these kids are going, okay, now wait, wait, I can do what with that equipment? <laughs> and they're the audiologists. Okay, we're all learning together, but we need all the pieces. To, to make it work. Um, the other thing that I want, so the edu educational audiologists matter. The other thing that's uh, in addition to the intervention, that early intervention I talked about from birth to three, um, we really, and again from state lead, we're really trying to spread the word on this, we really want to look at our three-year-olds differently. We want to get some precision assessments going. Uh, we need quality people doing those assessments, and we really want to see, are we looking at the whole child? Are we getting these pre-literacy skills into their brains? Because if they can't hear it, then we need to do visual phonics, cued speech, or other systems where we can get that information to them visually if they can't access it through hearing. And it all matters on the timing. But in addition to that, we want to start looking at the expanded core curriculum for deaf and hard of hearing students. It was developed in Iowa. It was um, the, the last edition of it is 2013. Some people in Texas use it, but it has not been formally adopted. We are in the process of trying to get it formally adopted in Texas so that each child with a hearing loss would use this just like we do with the visually impaired children in their expanded core curriculum. But we need to start looking at the expansion of things that a child needs to know to be school ready, to be able to access instruction, access the curriculum. If they can't work their equipment, if they don't understand their own hearing loss, if they can't self-advocate, if they don't know what it means to have a better ear, if they don't know when their equipment's not working, they're not going to be able to access the curriculum or even advocate for themselves. So even again with these little three-year-olds, and historically, what we've done with three-year-olds is said, woo-hoo, we did it. They're on track. And then we see them at five, and they're not on track, and they haven't even been to school for a day. So we really want us to be looking at these three-year-olds differently, looking at the expanded core curriculum, and even our assessments. And um, I've done some training this year. I plan to do more on it next year on assessments, especially for these kiddos. Again. The profoundly deaf kids, we kind of know more what we're doing. But we want some precision assessments that really help guide our decisions on getting services for these children. Thank you. And on your PowerPoint, you have my contact and Eden Yo's contact. If you have any questions, we can help you with it. Thanks.